I'm going to try to go from really the basics all the way to what I call the advanced, which is, you know, some of the unusual situations that you may run into for PAE. As you guys know that there's a there's a lot of um, there's a lot of courses out there, and those are very good. Um, I'm trying to condense almost all of it into one hour lecture, which is not really totally feasible. So I'm going to skip over some stuff um, and then get um, in more detail on some of the other stuff. So here's a general overview, right? We're going to go over what is BPH and LUTs, what are the treatment options, how to evaluate a patient for PAE in clinic, the pre-op workup that I do, and then focus in on the arterial anatomy, how I search for the prostate um, artery step by step, as well as how I do the entire procedure step by step. Um, and then the unique scenarios and the post-op care. And then I'll also go over a little bit of how we grew our practice here. So um, one year ago, we were at zero patients. Um, today, we're at about 150, actually more than that, consults and 70 plus cases. And that's all in one year, um, and all done by me. So it's, it's definitely possible to grow a practice. Um, so about BPH, right? Let's go over this quickly. 50% of men between 50 and 60, 90% of men older than 80. Everybody's gonna get BPH. Everybody out there is a man is gonna get BPH. Um, and so that is something to think about, right? I mean, this is a huge fertile opportunity for us as interventional radiologists to get involved in a disease process that involves quite literally half the population. Um, and because it involves half the population, I think that we can really play a great role in it with this innovative uh, procedure that we can offer. Um, I find this helpful for people who are just starting out and as well as for patients, and sorry the graphic is a little bit um, skewed here, but basically to compare the sizes of prostates, right? Um, walnut, about 20 cc's, that's kind of a normal prostate size. Ping pong ball, about 33 cc's or so. I would still consider this in the normal range a little bit uh, high. 40 is now when you're starting to get into the BPH range, and a lot of the patients we'll see are 40 plus, um, all the way up to 200 cc's or so. Um, I think showing this picture or just giving this um, picture to a patient when they walk in clinic and they say, I have a 100 cc prostate or 100 gram prostate, what does that mean? Um, you say, well, you're not a walnut, you're a tennis ball. It really gets, it really hits home what they're doing. Now, a couple of things to consider is that it's not always, um, yeah, the, right. the size of the gland does not always correlate to the, the symptoms that, that people uh, experience. Um, even people with small glands can. I have her phone number. Substantial symptoms. And if the patient is getting uh, worse transplant of so, uh, then. Uh, guys, if you could just mute if you're not, uh, or Trevor, if you can meet people who are not. Thanks, man. Um, okay, so to keep going. Um, you know, one of the important things here is that I think you have to talk like urologists, right? And we are not trained like urologists. We don't train in lower urinary tract symptoms or BPH uh, as we go through residency and fellowship. So now is the time to kind of brush up on it and understand it a little bit more, right? If you tell um, a urologist that you're treating BPH, that really, you know, they're going to look at you kind of uh, funky. If you're telling them, well, I'm treating lower urinary tract symptoms secondary to bladder outlet obstruction, now they're going to say, okay, you're at least talking my language. Um, so remember, lower urinary tract symptoms are not specific to BPH, right? Not everybody with lower urinary tract symptoms has BPH, and not everybody with BPH has lower urinary tract symptoms. People have 100 gram prostates and they're doing just fine. Um, what I find is that the IPSS score is really your best friend. So every single clinic patient I see, the, the first thing that we have them do is fill out this IPSS score. Uh, trust me, it saves you a whole lot of time when you're actually seeing the patient. Um, and it just helps us quantify, right? This is exactly the same score that any urologist would use. And so you're now, um, again, talking the same language. So I think it's imperative that every single patient that you see for a PAE consult gets an IPSS questionnaire. We've even moved this one online um, for my own practice so that we can see patients online and have them fill it out before. Um, a score between one and seven mild, eight and 19 moderate, 20 and 25 severe. And you know the patient, they will give them 20 minutes to go through this, give them, give them time. Um, I, if they haven't filled in by the time I walk out, I walk, uh, by the time I walk into the room, I actually walk out of the room and say, you know, take your time, fill this out. It gives you literally you know, 90% of, I think, the information that, that you need sometimes. So let's talk about the general treatment algorithm for BPH, right? Extremely common problem as we talked about. And remember that most of it is treated in a primary care setting, right? Most patients are not actually seeing urologists. Most patients are being treated by their primary care physicians. Um, how are they being treated? Well, medications are always first line. Alpha blockers, right? Alpha blockers relax the muscle, the prostate, and the bladder neck. 
And that relaxation of the muscle in the, in the prostate basically just so, um, allows the urine to flow more freely. Um, the most common one that you'll probably come across is Flomax, right? That's the one that um, almost everybody we use. That's the one that all primary care doctors are used to prescribing over and over again. So Flomax, they're going to put on uh, almost all their patients who have any symptoms of BPH. Side effects, dizziness, low blood pressure, weakness, retrograde ejaculation, because you are relaxing the sphincter. Um, all these are potential side effects of the, of the sort of primary medications, which are the alpha blockers. Most patients are actually treated with two medications, so dual therapy up front, um, or at least dual therapy once if primary therapy fails. And the second drug that's often added is an alpha reductase inhibitor, right? And that stops the conversion of testosterone to dehydrotestosterone, uh, which essentially gets you, uh, shrinks your tissue. These, the most popular ones would be finasteride. That's the one that you're gonna see over and over again. And this type of medication is typically prescribed in patients with larger prostates to shrink the prostate down over time. Um, side effects of these, this is, a, this is an androgen inhibitor, right? And so you're going to have actual um, endocrine side effects, decreased sex drive, decreased uh, ejaculation and erection, maybe even symptoms of depression. You can tell already with some of these side effects why men are not you know, necessarily gung-ho about getting on some of these medications or why compliance may be low, uh, particularly when they're not magic bullets. And, and that's one of the things I tell my patients that the, the medications are good, they work. In fact, something like Flomax can work within a couple of weeks, even a couple of days, and reduce your IPSS score by up to 10 points, um, but they're not magic bullets necessarily. Um, some people are even on triple line therapy, and Cialis is a common triple uh, third drug to add to the mix. The daily Cialis, obviously, that's the same Cialis that is also used in erectile dysfunction, but it basically promotes smooth muscle relaxation, and that is found to be somewhat helpful. So what do I tell my patients about medications, right? I, I say that, listen, these medications are work, um, thing, but again, they're not a magic bullet and one size does not fit all. A lot of these medications, unfortunately, uh, end up causing side effects. Some patients just don't want to be on any medications. Some patients, you know, they're in their 50s and they're starting these medications and they look and they say, you know, do I really want to be on this for the next 20, 30 years of my life? And they're not necessarily happy about that uh, combined with the side effects of it as well. A uh, couple of quick things to keep in mind. Remember, I said alpha blockers work within a couple of days to hours. Uh, alpha reductase inhibitors, five alpha reductase inhibitors, take months to really uh, kick in um, and sort of shrink that prostate. So once medications are off the table or once people are sort of maximized on their medications and still having symptoms, then we get to the surgical approaches, right? And, and the most common surgical approach is the TERP, which is being uh, pictured here. Now, I think it's worthwhile for anybody who's starting the, their PAE practice to understand um, a lot about the basic uh, urological procedures, because what you're going to get is you're going to get patients who are out there who have seen X or Y urologists and have been offered X or Y procedure, um, or have maybe even thought about, you know, they Googled on the internet, they found a procedure, and they ask you, hey, what do you think about Urolift? And you have to be, I think, conversant with them um, to to really give them a full evaluation. You say, listen, you have a 100 gram prostate and you have a median lobe, your lift is not going to work for you. So if you guys out there are just starting out, I think it's really imperative to actually study some of the urological procedures to understand what is going to work for particular patients or not. Um, in general, we have a couple of categories, right? Resection of the prostate, that's a TERP, right? This is the most common procedure. Typically in men over 100 grams, this is usually all they can be offered. Um, now with whole lip, they're offered a little bit more, but you know, the, traditionally this is what they're offered. And it's an, I always tell my patients, listen, TERP is effective. It's going to work for you. It's going to reduce your IPSS score. The question comes in of sort of, you know, what are the potential side effects and what are the risks and are you willing to take those? And if a patient has kind of come to clinic to me, they've already decided in their head that they don't want the TERP. They don't want the rotor rooter, right? And so it's, they've already decided that ahead of time, but I definitely tell them, listen, TERP works. The other thing I tell them is that since TERP is the gold standard, uh, one thing to consider if PAE doesn't work for you, TERP is always on the table. And in fact, it probably ends up becoming somewhat safer because we devascularize the organ uh, at that point. So your bleeding risks are, are less. Um, regardless, I think studying up on TERP, monopolar versus bipolar, uh, is helpful. 
Um, the other things that they can do are ablate the prostate, right? And that could be with plasma, that can be with laser, like Holup. They essentially, everything just creates room, right? Urolift is actually a, a suture, almost like a suture mediated uh, creation of the room. They uh, room around the urethra, they go into the urethra and essentially pin up areas of the prostate. Resume uses steam to um, to make that to make the to make essentially more room for for the urethra. So the urological procedures are are out there. You should read up on them. I'm not going to go into too much more detail here, but I think it's very helpful to know um, the basics of all of them. And you know, uro urology is minimally invasive. Okay, so when we tell when we tell a urologist, when you talk to a urologist and say you know, PAE is without a scalpel, they're gonna come back and say, so is TERP. I don't use a scalpel for TERP. Um, so is HOLIP. I don't use a scalpel for HOLIP. And so, you know, I think that what we have to do as interventional radiologists is, is sort of, uh, I, I like this quote, right? Taste the relish found in the competition because urology has minimally invasive procedures too. Um, but let's bring PAE to the forefront because we realize that, hey, maybe for certain patients or for a lot of patients, PAE is actually better um, and actually more minimally invasive than even a TERP. Requires no hospitalization, requires no catheter, et cetera. Um, you guys may have seen some of the um, some of the TERP battles. I mean, you guys are obviously very knowledgeable about some of the TERP battles that go on, right? Urologists are not going to want to refer these patients. Um, upfront, particularly your community urologist who makes money by doing procedures, just like we are not going to necessarily want to refer them, uh, refer a vascular surgeon our, you know, our PAD work if we get referred it, right? Um, in the AUA guidelines, the American Urological Association, they, this is their quote, PA is not recommended for the treatment of LUTs attributed to BPH outside of the context of a clinical trial. Um, and that's their expert opinion. This is what urologists know. This is what urologists are following. Even urologists at our own hospital will not refer patients uh, because they feel like it should only be done on clinical trials. So until these guidelines change, and if and when they change, we have to kind of fight for ourselves in a lot of ways here. Um, but the fight is possible, right? So we, I basically started our practice here about a year ago. And in that time, about 150 consults and 70 prostate artery embolizations. So it's definitely possible and feasible to do. Um, and I'm going to go through a little bit of sort of what I did to build that practice and now get some referrals from urology as well. So basics of a clinic visit. Let me shift gears a little bit, right? So here's what I do during every clinic vision. I said, as I said, step one is the IPSS, as well as I give them an additional questionnaire. This obviously helps me save time. Um, I get all their health history. It's, it's actually amazing how many 80 year olds I have coming in who are on no medications other than a, you know, other than Flomax. They're very healthy sometimes. Sometimes obviously they're not, but typically I find that if patients find me, they seem to be pretty healthy and BPH is the only, sorry, LUTS is the only thing that sort of ruining their life in some ways. So I give them that. Um, and then, I, you know, I just go in and listen to the patient. Again, because of the way I've set up my practice, a lot of these patients have done a ton of research. They're very educated. They know a lot about it. A lot of them already made up their mind that prostate artery embo is for them, or they've done the research and they've read on forums that this is the way to go. Um, and so I just listen to them and I kind of understand what they know and what they don't know. And then I definitely draw out everything. And I think that this really helps, right? So I, I actually take them through a case. I draw out everything on paper, um, show them what the risks are, show them what the benefits are, um, show them that, hey, I'm going to go through the radial arm, I'm going to go through the femoral. This is what the sheath looks like. And here's what you're going to be left at the end. This is the Band-Aid that you're going to be left with with at the end. And I think that really uh, hits home that, hey, listen, you know, this is minimally invasive. I'm going to be okay here. Um, here's what I want to know from every single patient I see, okay? I want to know their PSA levels. Have they had them drawn? Or are they being drawn, right? This is obviously a screen out for cancer. Now, keep in mind that an enlarged prostate can certainly elevate your PSA um, and, in fact, will elevate your PSA. So when patients come in with a, with a PSA of 7, but that seven has been constant for you know the last four years. Well, you know that's probably due to BPH, right? Um, and I you usually actually take the urologist's word on this, which is to say that if urologist has seen the patient and they have sort of you know just basically maintained that patient with the P, with a high PSA level, so be it. I don't. I'm not going to go search for cancer or go biopsy or treat this patient any differently. Um, we all we all sort of uh, understand that prostate cancer may be insidious. Uh, it may not uh, ever come to fruition, or it may be very serious. But basically, we, we want to make sure that their PSA levels are stable or low. 
I obviously want to know their current BPH medications as well as issues. Um, imaging, I, you know, I asked them what imaging have they had. A lot of these patients will have had um, uh, um, ultrasound sizing of the prostate, which is not always super accurate, but obviously does provide some information. Uh, the reason, the, where they get imaging and what they have is totally dependent on the urologist. So if a urologist has a truss, uh, a transrectal uh, urethral ultra, transrectal ultrasound, then they will be doing truss sizing. Um, same with cystoscopy, right? Uh, a lot of them will get cystoscopy in the office. Well, because, you know, urologists can bill for it and make sense for them to do the cystoscopy and see if there's a median lobe and give them some of their treatment algorithm. And so I think getting all the information you can from the uro urologist will just expedite your uh, workup substantially. And then other options, right? What have they discussed with the urologists? What have they researched? Um, I spend most of my time on this, uh, which is to say, again, I listen to the patient and find out what they're, what they are, um, what they've researched, what they know so far. Um, I was talking about the procedure, and I, I break down the procedure and sort of the side effects and risk. And I, I, this is exactly what I tell the patient. I was like, I say, listen, there are risks of the procedure, which are things that I don't want to happen and don't expect to happen, but can happen, right? Non-target embolization being the biggest risk there. The blood supply to the bladder, the blood supply to the penis, the blood supply to the rectum is all closely associated. And so non-target embolization and the uh, eventual downstream effects of that are, can happen, and that's a risk that I want to avoid. They're always going to ask, well, how often does that happen? What do you do if the beads go in there? Can you get them out? Is it permanent? And, you know, as, as you guys all know, the reality is that, well, we can't get beads out, but it's all, it's very dependent. If a couple of beads reflux, does that mean anything? 99.99999% uh, of the time, no, you know, it doesn't really mean much. Uh, some of these other territories have great blood supply, which is great, right? Rectum, bladder, very rich collateral blood supply. Um, but obviously there have been cases of non-target embolization causing issues, but I tell my patients, listen, this is very, very rare, but that is the biggest risk that I'm worried about. Obviously the usual risks of arteriography are there, bleeding, um, arterial injury, stroke if I'm using, um, if I'm doing a radial approach. And then I talk about side effects, which is, I say, listen, these are things that I expect to occur. These are going to occur. These are going to happen, which is they say, you're going to have dysuria. Okay, you're going to have him out of. You're going to have hematuria, or you potentially are going to have hematuria. If you do, it's not an issue uh, that usually clears. And for about five percent of patients, you may actually even go into acute urinary retention. Uh, and I just simply say it's because the prostate swells because it's, before it shrinks, and so it's possible that you're going to go into acute urinary retention, and we're going to have to place a catheter in. Um, you know, scattered throughout the presentation, I kind of introduced some questions that I had when I started. Um, and I didn't really have answers to, and so I've scattered those in, and then also at the end, I've put them in. And so some of you might be thinking, do you know, do I have to get preoperative imaging on every patient? And I would actually say that it's not needed. Um, you know, a CTA or an MRA can be helpful in your planning purposes, but it's it's definitely not needed. As I've done more and more of these, I really find that the angiography is is the by far the most helpful thing. Um, I will do an MRI if I'm if I'm worried about cancer or um, you know, if, if I have some time and essentially the MRI takes longer to get. And so if I have a lot of time, if I'm booking out a couple of months in advance, I'll say, okay, let's get an MRI just to see. Um, I do like some imaging in the, in the context of it at least gives me a, a, a accurate gland size or a semi-accurate gland size. Obviously there's like the bullet versus ellipsoid measurements, et cetera, but it gives me an idea of the gland size. Um, when I look at the arterial anatomy, if I look at the arterial anatomy, I'm really looking for takeoffs, but I no longer try to map out every artery. I, when I started doing this, I was really doing a lot of 3D reconstructions. I was sitting there and trying to find the best angles and you know, jotting down that, okay, the left is coming off the operator at this angle and here's what I see. I, I've actually found that to be less helpful as I've done more and more of these. And instead, I just look for general areas of concern or ideas. Um, and so here is a, you know, here's an MRA. Um, that we're, that my group was able to, our, you know, my uh, MR group was able to come up with a nice protocol for it. Um, and essentially, I will look at every of these images and kind of the, I will start at the prostate and I'll trace my way back. So here is probably prostatic artery. Here it comes back. It's looping around. I, I kind of keep following it around, keep following it around. Okay, I see it's coming off of, you know, this uh, probably the obturator here. And then I come all the way up and I kind of look again for generalities and I see, okay, Patient's got some tortuous uh, internal iliacs. Patient, hey, 
I look at the arch, this arch doesn't look so bad. But these are the kind of things that I'm looking for. Again, I'm not necessarily going in 3D reconstructing any of these anymore uh, because I find that it's not all that helpful at the end of the day. So that's my general approach. And now, you know, what I want to go over a little bit, and this, you know, this is going to be good for some of the trainees out there, particularly these early slides, is angiography and what you got to be looking for. Um, and so before we get into anything about PAE, what I think you need to know is, okay, on, a, on an ipsilateral oblique view of the, of the pelvis, what are the branches that I should be able to identify? And so for any of you guys starting out there, um, I think there are four branches that you should be able to identify in every internal iliac angio, okay? And those are the superior glute, right? And that's the big one that's gonna obviously supply the butt. It's gonna swing off to the side. That's gonna be the pudendal, the C-shaped artery that's gonna go around the notch. That's gonna be the obturator, the artery that ends in a terminal V and the internal, uh, sorry, the um, inferior, uh, inferior glute, which is gonna be the, uh, the, the other big artery here. So take a look at this and I'm gonna put up the next one and just take a second and see if you can identify each of those branches, right? So again, on every single internal iliac and angiogram, I wanna identify these four big branches at least as a starting point before I even start my search for the prostate artery. All right, so hopefully you guys are able to find the superior glute, the pudendal, again, the pudendal is that C-shaped artery, the in, uh, superior glute is gonna swing lateral. You're gonna have the obturator, which ends in the terminal V, and you're gonna have the inferior glute, right? One more, right? Again, for you guys just to visualize and see. And take a look, by the way, you know, some of these men, tortuous arteries, right? These are some of the harder cases that you guys are gonna do um, in terms of angiography. You very tortuous iliacs, very tortuous arteries up and over the bifurcation can be, can, you know, take a while in some of these patients. Um, so this is not a, you know, a straightforward UFI, um in a young female, right? These are older men with atherosclerotic disease with tortuous aortas um, that sometimes that can be the most troublesome part. So again, four, four um, branches, superior glute, pudendal, C-shaped, right? Inferior glute, obturator ends in that terminal V. So keep those in mind for every single case. All right, there's another one. So now let's think about some of the other branches that we're going to look at now that we're gonna actually start searching for the prosthetic artery, right? So the prosthetic artery um, has variable origin, right? You guys have probably all heard that the prosthetic artery comes off of many different places. And so the idea is that you need to understand some of the patterns, and I've listed some of the most common patterns, depending on what you, you know, who you read, there's gonna be differences in some of these, but this is the general idea. The superior vesicular is gonna, is gonna have a common trunk with the prosthetic artery in about 30% of cases, and 30% is gonna come off the pudendal, in 30%, it's gonna come straight off of the anterior division. And in maybe 20%, it's gonna come off the obturator. And then of course, there are fringe cases as well, but this is a general guideline, right? And so once you've identified the four big branches, now identify the branches where you think that, okay, where could the prosthetic artery come off of? And the first one I always look at is the superior vesicular. I'm sorry, let me go back. Superior vesicular is gonna be the first branch off of the anterior division, right? So this is the posterior division, this is the anterior division, right? Posterior division is gonna be the superior glute, the iliolumbar. The anterior division is going to be the, um, uh, the rest of it. In this case, we actually have an obturator that looks like it's coming off of the um, uh, posterior division. But in any case, let's, let's focus in on the superior vesicular here. The first branch off of the anterior division, first branch off the anterior division. It often looks like this. It's gonna have an inferior vesicular branch and a superior vesicular branch. That's a very common origin, okay? Um, again, let's, let's look. These are the different places it can origin, originate from, right? First branch, you're gonna be superior vesicular. You have the obturator, ends in that terminal V. You have the pudendal, which swings around, or maybe it's got its own origin off of the anterior division, right? Which it would be somewhere in this, in this range here before it splits off into some of the other branches. So those are the places that I will search for. Now, we're gonna go over a little bit about how I search again in a second, but I, once you get to the actual artery, this is what it should look like, right? It's typically tortuous because the, the gland is hypertrophied and stretched. Usually you're gonna get the hemigland opacified. So you're gonna get half of it opacified nicely and that's kind of 
very indicative that you're in the prostate. It's a nice ball, half of it's identified. Um, and then you may see cross pelvic collaterals. And typically these are the, the uh, capsular supply of the prostate and you'll see them go over to the other side. So some of these are, are helpful just indicators that, okay, I'm in the prostate. Now I've chosen in this example, three pretty large prostates. Um, and so it's pretty obvious that you're in the prostate, but just ingrain this in your head. This is what you wanna be looking for, right? Tortuous artery that comes around, has many squiggles, is gonna go, you get the nice parenchymal blush. Um, that's sort of what you end up looking for here. So now how do I search? Now everybody's probably gonna have their own search pattern, but this is sort of um, how I learned to search um, and it, it works typically for me, right? So the first thing I look for is an S-shaped artery between the pudendal and the obturator, right? Let's go over again, superior glute, inferior glute, pudendal, obturator, right? And I'm looking for an S-shaped artery in between there. Boom. Now this, uh, I'm gonna check for tortuosity, not fortuosity, tortuosity, and turns because that's typically a good starting point for me to say, okay, you know, that may be the prosthetic artery. So again, S-shaped artery, between the pudendal and obturator is some of my or some of my starting points. Here's another example, right? So I'm looking for an S-shaped artery between the obturator, terminal V, and the pudendal. Okay, I see one. Perfect. I also see this S-shaped artery, right? Which is common. I'm gonna see other S-shaped arteries, but as you do more and more of these, you're gonna kind of be able to identify, okay, which one really goes to where I want it to be. It turns out this is a superior vesicular, right? first branch off of the off of the anterior division, superior vesicular. And I can see that, hey, it's going towards the top here. If this was not subtracted, you would see sort of the pelvis is the, the uh, pelvic brim is down here. And okay, this is going more towards it. So that's what, you know, that's what I'm looking for. Now, sometimes the downstream is obvious and it's the upstream that causes an issue. So when I first started out, I was like, oh yeah, there it is. Woo, -hoo. I'm super excited. I found, I found the prosthetic, I'm, I'm stoked. And then, you know, I would kind of look back and say, well, where the hell is it coming from? Like, where is it, you know? And, and here's another case, I can see it here. Okay, everybody after a few of these is gonna be able to identify that's the prosthetic, boom, perfect. Okay, now let me trace it back. Here it comes back, here it comes back. Well, I'm not really sure what goes on here you know, oh, maybe it comes this way. Okay, fine. And then I'm here. Well, does it come off directly the anterior division? Is that where it comes off? Does it come off of the superior vesicular? So does it come this way and then shoot this way? These are the kinds of things that you're going to have to sort of get better at. And the more you do, the more you'll learn to get better at and sort of watching. And, and I think going frame by frame is really important on your digital subtraction and geography, because when you do, you'll see, okay, you know what? that superior vesicular fills exactly at the same time that this fills. So I think this is actually coming off the superior vesicular and not coming off its own anterior division. And that's a huge, huge time sink. If you thought that this was coming off the anterior division and started searching around for this, and in reality it was coming off the superior vesicular, you're gonna, you're gonna hit your head at the end and say, why did I waste all that time? Um, so just for anatomy again, superior vesicular, inferior vesicular, and then this is gonna be prosthetic in this case. Um, and here it is, right? So again, I just, the more, I'm showing you a lot of examples just to get in your guys' head what that prosthetic looks like. Um, I really enjoy Roadmap um, and, and use it on all my cases. And I'll go over a little bit about sort of how I do it, but I, I really enjoy the Roadmap view. And so I threw that in there here. Um, again, this is this artery came, swung this way and here it is. Now I'm in, I'm injecting from here and I see the, I see the prosthetic hemigland tortuous arteries. Um, again, you know, I kind of am hitting on this because sometimes the downstream is obvious and the upstream is what's, what's really tough, right? I mean, this is a case where we actually see, I think this was the prosthetic artery in this case, and it came off, uh, this is a superior vesicular, the prosthetic artery came off of the superior vesicular and it was very easy to think, okay, does it actually come off the anterior division here? It, it's hard. It's hard until you sort of look at a lot of them and decide. Um, Quick note, you know, if it comes off the obturator, oftentimes it'll swing lateral and then back medial. Uh, I think, you know, Sonny Bagla uh, told me this when he, when he lectured to me like three years ago, the first time I heard about this, and he was, this is a trick and I have found that it actually works. When you, if your prostate comes off the obturator, typically it'll swing lateral and then back medial. Again, it's an S-shaped artery between the pudendal and the obturator, a good starting point for your search. Um, 
I'll, I'll just pause here quickly and just say, you know, again, drop any questions that you guys have um, in, in the chat as you as we go. I'm sort of looking at it so I can answer any questions that you guys have as we go, but we'll definitely open it up at the end too. If there's anything I'm saying that's unclear or we need to go back, just let me know. Um, you know, there is a learning curve on these cases for sure, 100%. Um, and I bring up this one particular case. This is one of my very early cases that I did. Um, and basically, I spent two and a half hours trying to get into what was obvious to me was a prosthetic artery, right? This one right here. Very obvious is a prosthetic artery. But as you came back to the origin, it was just really hard for me to understand where this was coming off of. And I thought it was coming right off of the... Um, I thought it was a trifurcation that was coming right off of the anterior division. And so actually in this particular case, I couldn't catheterize this artery. And this guy catheterized the other one, he had a great response. He came back six months later and he said, you know, doc, I, I had a really good initial response and I feel like my symptoms are coming back. And I said, you know what, let me give it another try. And literally two and a half hours the first time, 15 minutes the second time, uh, because there is a substantial learning curve in terms of how um, you approach these things. So again, looking back at the first case, I was like, you know, I'm not sure where this artery is really originating from. And no matter how many views I did, I wasn't really able to get it. And here was the essential problem, right? The problem for me was, okay, green is prosthetic artery. And I have basically two different scenarios here. Was it that the green, the prosthetic artery, came directly off of the anterior division and came down? Or was it that I actually had an obturator, a very short obturator trunk, which is in yellow, and then the prosthetic artery came directly off at a 90 degree bend? And actually, on the cone beam on the very first case I did, because I was sort of looking for this, I knew it was this, but it was just really hard for me to catheterize. I, I kept getting into the obturator, I couldn't get myself back in here, it was it was all about learning curve, you know. I, I at the end of the day, I was able to get in here the second time in 15 minutes. As I said, it was very easy because it was all just about understanding how to shape your catheters and understanding where to search and look for. But I think the teaching point in this case is really okay. It's very hard sometimes directly to understand is it this scenario where it's coming off of the anterior division or maybe even off superior vesicular, or is it this scenario where you actually have an obturator and then um, and then the off the obturator at a right angle came the uh, PA as well as the superior vesicular. And so this was the scenario I was in, and here is the second case, you know, I got in. And you can see how distal I sometimes get my wire to really be able to give me support to go all the way as distal as I can. And this is the cone beam proving that I was, that I was in, obviously, prostate, right? You can see half the prostate uh, lights up. Now, yeah, I mean, things I've learned are that, you know, sometimes the bigger the prostate, sometimes the harder the origin can be. It's not always that the, that a, that a, simp, a big prostate is going to lead to a big origin. It's going to be really hard and vice versa. Sometimes small prostates have easy origins that are easy. And I haven't really found a good correlation for those of you guys out there who have done other cases. I mean, maybe you guys have, have not, or maybe you have. It's not always the case that big prostates always lead to the, the easier cases. Now, a couple of unusual origins, right? This is an origin off directly off the superior glute, right? This is a superior glute, swings lateral, and this origin was directly off of this. And this is, again, so, some of the frustrations of these cases, but also some of the, the beauties of these cases that I looked at this and I was like, oh, phew, I'm gonna be in in five seconds, call the next patient down, we're gonna be done. It took me an hour to get into this branch. And, and I actually called my partner in, he spent an hour trying to get it in, and then eventually we got it in. And so it wasn't just my uh, fumbling around. Like this was a really hard origin to get into. Obviously it's a, big, it's a, it's a vessel that's coming off at a 90 degree turn from a, from a big artery. It's a small artery coming off a big artery and it, it took a while to get into. And so sometimes the big prostates, which this is, uh, can take a while and other times it can, be, it can be really easy. So this is an unusual origin off of the superior glute. Now uh, for trainees out there, things to always keep in mind are the corona mortis, right? And so when I said that when I look at um, some of the MRAs and CTs I get for big picture things, like this is one of obviously the big picture things I'm looking for. So here it is. So I look and I say, oh, you know what? There's actually an obturator that's coming off of the external iliac. Here's the reconstruction of it. I see the obturator, which comes down here, coming off of the external iliac. This is the inferior, sorry, the um, uh, inferior epigastric, right? That's coming all the way up here. Um, and so I knew right away in this case that that's where I was going to search because I didn't have to waste my time. And so here's the case, right? Um, catheter from the radial down into the, down into the origin. Again, I see the inferior epigastric here. And then I see 
operator ending that terminal V, I get into there, you know, I get into here and I also see this thing, right? This is cavernosal. That's no good. Not where I want to be. Back it up. So this is where I was in this. I back it up and I come back. I'm sorry, actually, I was down here in this, in, uh, in this angio. I was down here and I inject and I see cavernosal. Nope. Have to back it up and get around into there. And then I, and then I see obviously prostate, right? So chronomortis, uh, you know, the accessory aberrant operator seen in up to 30% of cases. And remember that the origin of the prostate comes off the operator in about the 20% of cases. And so really about 5% of cases that you're looking for the PA, uh, you may be finding it off of the external iliac. Also keep in mind, uh, for those of you guys that are new out there to this, if you, see, if you do pelvic angiography and you see an empty pelvis, you got to search for the external iliac to see. If you don't see an operator on that, you got to search. So general overview, here's how I sort of uh, go through it. This is my step-by-step, -step, right? So access site, I do radial or femoral. If the patient is 5'10 or shorter, I do femoral. Sorry, I do radial. If the patient is 5'10 or greater, I do, um, I do a femoral. I really find that 5'10, 5'11 cutoff is a good one. I've definitely, um, even with 5'10 patients, run into catheter length issues on some of these because you can have to go very deep. You can potentially have to coil things that are extremely deep into, you know, into the pelvis. And so the 150 centimeter catheter length isn't always great. If you are doing radial, I would highly recommend, uh, forget the TUI because it gives you an extra two centimeters or so. And that typically really helps in some of these cases. Um, my room setup is always set up for a cone beam CT. So I'm going to go over how often I do a cone beam CT, but I always have it as a potential bailout if I can't find my way. So it's always set up for it. So in our particular uh, room configuration, which is a GE room, I actually flip the patient if it's radial um, and otherwise I do a, a standard access um, if it's femoral. My equipment, five French sheets all around, uh, unless it's a difficult arch, in which case I'll put in a six French Balkan right up front. Uh, C2 and pudendal from the groin or a 120 vert from the radial. Um, and then my go-to wire 100% of the time is a fathom wire. I find that this, the fathom wire is, is just the right combination of, you know, sort of soft tip, uh, soft floppy tip, as well as enough support. Obviously, you know, wires, catheters, this is dependent on operator. I mean, people are great with their own wires. Um, I really find that the fathom wire is, is perfect in 90% of cases, but if I have to um, troubleshoot, I will go to a synchro wire. An 014 synchro wire, synchro two wire is my troubleshooting wire. And there's definitely been times where I've had to go to that wire. And you know, I, I'll even, there are curves, um, I wish I had a nice city of this, but there are curves that you may not be able to take with a fathom wire or any other wire. And I think certainly not a double angle glide, just given how stiff it is. Um, but with a synchro wire, you can almost double it over and be able to take a curve around um, some of these bends. So this is my this is my setup. Again, obviously anybody uh, who's doing this is gonna have their own setup, but I prefer the fathom and I prefer a 2 prograde. In troubleshooting cases, I'll go with a synchro and then maybe a 2 prograde in, in cases where I can't uh, pass the catheter for whatever reason. Um, for coils, I, I typically just use non-detachable halal coils. I just shoot them in. Uh, I find them cheap and effective. And balloon occlusion catheters, well, you know, I, I've tried balloon occlusion catheters, and I have to say that they can be helpful, but the catheter that's on the market right now is just completely unreliable. Uh, it gets stuck. It gets break. It breaks. It works on one side. It doesn't work on the other side. Uh, they've actually, I think, taken it off the market, which is the embolic sniper catheter. I, it just it is a good concept, but it's not there yet, uh, in my opinion. And so, if you're starting out, I would really recommend actually just using your traditional microcatheter that you're comfortable with, because you'll get into situations where your your sniper gets stuck and it's a pain in the butt, um, which I had a bunch of, and so I don't use it anymore. And then 100 to 300 embospheres is my typical um, go-to for, for an embolic. And then for nursing, um, no Foley. So I find that the Foley catheter is completely unhelpful to me. Um, actually, the first case I did, um, I was saying, okay, we're going to, I heard, you know, you should put a Foley in the first 20 cases you do. So I said, okay, let's put a Foley in. And the first thing the nurses did is say, well, you want me to put a Foley into this patient with BPH? I was like, yeah, sure. It'd be no problem. You, you know, you've placed Foley, you've placed a million more Foley's than I have. And they couldn't get it in. And I said, well, I'm not going to try. I'm not going to torture the guy. But basically, we already tortured the guy. We tried to put the Foley in three times. We couldn't get it in. And I did the case without, and I was like, you know what? There was no help. I, I don't see how a Foley would have helped me. And so since then, um, I just don't put a Foley in. I don't find it helpful at all. Um, I do give the patient a condom cath, though, because it allows for voiding on the table. And I asked nursing to um, get nitroglycerin in the room. 
um, before we start. All my cases are done under moderate sedation. So here's step by step, right? Arterial access under ultrasound, omni flush up and over, and then an ipsilateral oblique DSA. Usually I'm five for 25. Usually my um, my projection is 35 ipsy and 10 cranial. Uh, 35 to 55 ipsy is sort of what's described, and I think that's a good starting point. And then blend mask or road mask for microcatheter placement. Um, the pelvis doesn't move, and so this is really, really nice. Um, once I get into the prostate, I, I do a prostate DSA. I always go back to an AP projection for the prosthetic DSA because I really find that that um, helps me conceptualize and visualize it best. And then typically I'll give 100 to 200 micrograms of nitroglycerin to be able to um, uh, dilate the artery as much as possible. And then I embolize very, very, very slowly. So I'm talking about, um, I use again, 100 to 300 beads, um, not cc, sorry, 100 to 300 micrometers, uh, microbeads, and then I dilute them in 10 cc's of saline and 10 cc's of the contrast. So essentially, I just take the, the endospheres and I draw up a whole bunch of contrast, and that's my dilution of it. Um, and then I give 0.5 cc's at a time, and I reconstitute very, very often. So every 0.5 cc's, I reconstitute. My fellows out there hate me for this because they are sitting in there embolizing, but that's what I do. Every 5.5 cc's, reconstitute, get a new syringe, re redo it. Um, I find that that's how you, if you, when you don't do that, you tend to get a clog of uh, particles and then you don't get as much embolic in as you want. And then periodic DSAs. So I'm always DSAing um, as I'm going because collaterals will open up over time. So just a quick, uh, as a cheat sheet, right? Five for 25 injection from the internal iliac, 35 degrees, 10 degrees cranial as my projection, hand injection for the prosthetic artery and AP. And I really, you know, the, the fact that the pelvis doesn't move is huge. Using road maps and last, uh, last image blended masks is so big um, for me. I mean, this, this has saved me so much time and has really saved me so much contrast because I do one run and that's it. Now I use that run to do the rest of my, the rest of my case right up front. Um, I find that the CT overlays and CT angi angiography overlays are way less precise. And since we're talking about things that are millimeters here, um, I really don't find that those can be all that helpful um, at all. And I've stopped doing them. Maybe with newer software packages, they'll be better. Um, keeping an open mind, I think, is important because typically we'll do this as an LAO and uh, cranial 10, right? That's my typical projection. But I look and I, I identify the prosthetic artery. But you know what? I'm not sure where this comes off of. Like, where is the origin of this exactly? Because if I get the exact origin, then it's going to be very easy for me, again, to do a simple roadmap or a DSA hold, and I'm going to know where it is. And so I actually, in this case, did a did an, um, contralateral oblique um, and found the origin very easily. And now you can imagine how much easier it's going to be for me to get my microcatheter in here than it was in here, where I'm trying to search and not exactly sure where it comes off. You know, so sometimes keeping an open mind is is nice, and doing it in a completely different projection does help. What's my endpoint? My endpoint is you know pruning of the vessels, no longer seeing the vessels. Here you're going to see a bunch of seminal vesicle branches, and so these are probably seminal vesicle branches that are back here. And so I've stopped. Right, this is my endpoint. I, I see no more prostatic flush. Um, you may have heard of or seen the perfected technique, um, which was described in Brazil, where essentially you do some proximal embolic first and then go distal. And, and here's an example of me sort of doing the technique where I've embolized it proximally and then I've gotten my microcatheter as distal as I can, and I'll put in some more embolic there. Now, I don't usually do this. Um, you know, I don't necessarily have a, a, a dog in the race here. Um, I, I, because I use small particles, I'm able to get a, as many particles as I want in from a distal, um, or sorry, from a proximal point most of the time. But if I can't, sometimes I will just go in distal and put in some more. Um, you know, I really want patients obviously to have good responses. And so the more embolic I get, I find the better responses are. Now, a uh, quick note on cone beam, right? I think it's obviously very helpful when you start off. Um, I have particularly found that I can wean my tolerance on it once I've gotten more comfortable. Um, and so that was probably the first 10 or so cases where I was doing cone beams up front on everybody. And then I kind of, you know, now at this point, I probably do cone beams only in 30% of cases or so. And there are two uh, places where I'll do a cone beam. The first is really from the internal iliac. And if I do a cone beam from the internal iliac, it's a three for 36 injection, six second delay. If I do it from the prosthetic artery, it's, I usually use 0.5 for four cc's with a three second delay. This is my formula. Um, and this typically works. This is gonna be if I need to see if there's any collaterals around or if I'm not 100% sure I'm in prostate. 
this is going to be to see if I, if I look at the initial run and I'm like, you know what, I can't really identify where the prostate is. Um, let me go ahead and do a cone beam and be able to identify right away. And then there are some people who do it directly from the aorta to get both sides. And I can see obviously the, the benefit of that. Um, I just find that at least in, in my machine, the software packages aren't useful. When I do the entire aorta, it's very cumbersome to sort of subtract out half the pelvis. For others, maybe you have better packages and you're gonna be able to do this. And so, you know, if you're gonna do it from the aorta, you can get both sides at once. Typically an injection I'll do, I would recommend as a four for 44 at the six second array. Now, cone beam is very helpful. But I really uh, stress to my fellows, like, don't forget a good DSA. I, I think a good DSA is really your friend. You will see things on DSA that you're going to miss on cone beam, left and right. Um, you're going to see collaterals. You're going to see the, the sort of filling patterns, which you're not going to be able to really appreciate on cone beam, but you will on DSA. Um, and, you know, I guess I put the slide in because you can miss, you know, this was a case um, where I, I thought we were in and I actually looked at my fellow and I said, okay, well, I think we should embolize. And the fellow actually looked back. He's like, you know, if I was by myself, I think I would cone beam here. And I said, okay, let's cone beam. And wow, they, you know, like he clearly had a sense of something because we were off. This was a, this was a vesicular branch. This was not the prosthetic branch. So even after looking at a lot of these, I think you can miss. And so certainly doing uh, cone beams can be very helpful if you're not a hundred percent sure. And um, I put this example in because it's a beautiful example of vesicular angiography. Um, this is what a bladder branch, this is what the superior vesicular looks like, right? It drapes over the bladder really nicely. And you can see that I thought I was going, I was putting my macrocatheter in something that was going to be uh, the prosthetic I injected. Nope, not even close, right? This is the superior vesicular. Um, this is again why I kind of find a Foley to be unhelpful. Like, this is very obvious to me that this is a superior vesicular, right? The bladder is right here. I'm looking for something down here. Like where, where, how does a Foley help me in this, in, in this case? I'm not sure. This is again why I sort of don't put it in. But again, want to show you guys this example. This is superior vesicular. This is not what you want to see. Branches that drape over uh, and cross from one side to another. That's the bladder. Now, collaterals, right? So how do you deal with collaterals? And um, you're going to see collaterals on all your cases or a lot of your cases. I would say 50% of your cases, you get into the prostate and you see something else, right? And so you have to deal with them. They're, they're gonna, there's a lot of anastomosis, there's a lot of collaterals. The most popular ones are gonna be a rectal collateral. And any branch in, in this angio that sort of comes down straight is something you should watch out for. So if you see a straight branch that's not going across the midline, but really coming straight in a craniocaudial projection, you're going to have to think about, okay, is that a rectal branch or something else? And so in this case, I actually investigated it. I found it was a rectal branch. I coiled it and I come back and I get prostate, right? Um, and so what I would typically do is get into these branches, coil them. And again, I use simple halal coils, drop one or two, and usually I'm done, and then go back into the other branches. You can also gel foam slurry or something along those lines that protect these branches. Um, Again, craniocaudal orientation, what you want to watch out for. And here's a, a tip that I've sort of have found, you know, if I'm uncertain um, where I am or if a branch is a rectal branch or not, I will actually, you know, kind of hold out the injection for a little bit longer. And what I'll end up seeing is retrograde filling of the, of the superior rectal from the IMA. So here's a case of that. So I'm in an artery that I think is prosthetic and definitely look at that. I get some prosthetic flush. But wait, you know, I see this thing that's coming straight down here. Let me go investigate that. So I put my catheter in there and I investigate it. And lo and behold, this is rectal blush, right? This is rectal. Um, that's exactly uh, what you're looking for. And hey, cool. Look, I actually see the superior rectal coming from the IMA. It's actually filling retrograde, right? So this is when you see the superior um, rectal branch, you can be sure that you're in a rectal. Obviously, the rectal blush helps too. But going back to here, you're really looking for that straight. If you see something straight, watch out. You, you potentially don't want to want to go into there. Um, the other um, collaterals that are typical are predendal collaterals, right? Um, so here is a case, again, prostate. I see nice uh, prostate, but I also see this branch that goes down right to the cavernosum. Not a great idea. Don't embolize the penis, right? So I'm going to get in there. I'm going to drop some coils. And now, boom, I only see prostate after that, right? That's exactly what we want to see. So protection of these branches, I think, is, um, is important. Um, accessory pudendals, you can see in 20% of cases. Um, 
they'll often uh, anastomose with the anterior pudendal and obviously non-target embolization of here is something you want to try to avoid. So don't embolize the penis, you know, do intermittent DSAs because by the way, once you start embolizing, you may see new pudendal collaterals come up. You see this all the time. So after a couple of cc's of embolic, I'll do a DSA again to see if there's any new collaterals that have formed or anything else that I'm seeing now that I haven't seen before. And I think it's very important to, to make sure that you're looking for that. So intermittent DSA while you're embolizing is, is helpful. Um, this is another pudendal collateral. And um, if, you, if you're on Twitter, uh, I think Ari Isaacson has sort of um, coined this the pina cava and you can kind of see why it comes directly midline, goes down to the penis. Um, again, something you want to look out for. There are cases when actually, you know, I, I haven't actually even seen the prosthetic blush, or maybe I've just seen a hint of the prosthetic blush. And until I embolize the collateral, I didn't see it. And so here's a case where, you know, again, I get a nice straight branch here and I'm saying, you know what, that's no good. I don't like straight branches, but I see something in here and I think I'm in the right territory. And so what I actually did in this case is I went down there and embolized this pudendal. And once I embolized this pudendal, then I saw the prosthetic blush. Um, and then I knew I was in prostate, right? Again, how many tortuous vessels that go in, this was definitely prostate and that's when I embolized. And so it, this is, again, what I think makes prostate artery embolization so much fun is that each case really has its own challenges. Uh, I, if I started off and I did this and I said, okay, you know, that's a pudendal I'm, I'm pulling out, I would have never gotten back, you know, but there was something about here and something about the blush that I saw that I thought, you know what, I think I'm still there. Let me coil this and see and it, it ended up being um, a good call in this case. Um, there are cases where you're going to have to have, you're gonna have actually occluded origins. So here's a case where we had an occluded origin. You know, I searched for that S-shaped artery between the obturator and the pudendal, and I just couldn't find it. And I looked on cone beam and there was just a mess, a tangle of vessels here, there was no origin. But I looked at this pudendal and I actually saw stuff going around and so this is a case where I actually treated all the way around from the pudendal, from the distal pudendal here, and I was able to light out the prostate. And this guy had a 130 gram prostate or something. So it was a big prostate, yet his, his origin was completely occluded. And the only way to treat him was through this, through this pudendal collateral. And so if you, if you don't see um, the origin, and you know, this was a case where I cone beam because I couldn't see the origin. I said, let me see if I can find it. Still couldn't see the origin, still couldn't make out anything. I had to go and I saw it from this distal pudendal. So that's a way to potentially embolize. Um, so if you can't find the origin, you know, search for distal collaterals that may be supplying the prostate, often the distal pudendal. And keep in mind that a catheter length, you know, 150 can become tricky. You can imagine you're all the way out here. And so that's, um, if you're, this was a case where I came from radial, definitely avoiding the 2E was, was nice in this case. Um, cross pelvic collaterals you're going to see often. Um, so this is angiography again of the prostate. I see the other prosthetic artery from the other side filling. I probably also see an I, IPA uh, accessory branch filling down here as well. Um, you may have to go across and coil things, but keep in mind if you go across and coil things, you're going to occlude yourself on the other side. Um, or you just may um, have to be careful with your embolic. You may also realize that because there's cross pelvic collaterals, their first side oftentimes will uh, take more than your second side. So this is uh, another thing I'll point out, as I said before, is DSA angiography is extremely helpful for flow patterns, which cone beam will often miss, right? And these flow patterns help me understand if I'm gonna embolize safely or not. If I see this all the way at the end, you know, maybe I'm okay embolizing very slowly, very safely. If I see it right up front, you know, maybe I have to do something to deal with it before I, before I embolize it. Um, I throw in a seminal vesicle um, slide here because I have seen uh, cases of hematospermia and I have seen seminal vesicles definitely that um, I couldn't get past or that were in the embolization, em embolic field and I've embolized them. And basically the patients had hematospermia for a couple of days, a couple of weeks actually, and then it goes away. So I guess seminal vesicles are, you know, uh, okay to take out. Obviously, you know, you want to avoid them if you can, but I've only had the case of self-resolving hematospermia. So that, those are some of the, you know, um, I guess, tricks of um, trying to find vessels and actual prostate and actual um, anatomy. A couple of things that I'll point out for those of you guys who are starting off, you know, there's, there's really good data now um, about most of this. I mean, you know, we, there was just a randomized uh, trial um, versus sham that was put out. Um, luckily, this one beat the kyphoplasty trial and actually showed that 
PAE worked. Um, there is the um, SIR um, Society paper. There's a, a paper by uh, Riyadh in, um, in the urology journals, actually. There's the ROPE study. So, I mean, there's a bunch of different studies out there that have kind of shown that PAE is now safe, PAE is effective. Um, when I started out doing this, I was skeptical though. You know, I really was. I, I said, okay, you know, I, I'm gonna do it. My practice, uh, I'm gonna build my practice around this. And I started out doing it. And I was, I was honestly skeptical, right? I'm always skeptical of actually research results in general, but I can really say that this is so common for me which is the, the IPSS score after I do the procedure and see them back in six to eight weeks, I get zeros and ones and twos across the board. Um, and you know, the reductions we're seeing are 15, 20 points. Um, and patients are, you know, peeing like they're teenagers again. You know, it's, I caution all my patients, listen, you're not going to always get a fantastic response, but I got to say that I'm, um, I'm myself pleasantly surprised at the results that uh, we've been getting with PAE. Like people are really, their lives are changed. And you know, the quality of life symptom score uh, comes down from a five to a one or six to a zero. And people are really like, you've given my life back. And, and by the way, because you do that for them, they tell their friends and they tell their friends' friends and they tell their friends' friends' friends. And that really helps grow the practice, right? A um, couple of things for post-procedure um, quickly. Phase one, you know, is what I tell people is you're going to have increased frequency in dysuria almost always for about a week or so after the procedure. In fact, a lot of increased frequency is normal. I have patients who pee every couple of minutes uh, after procedure for about a week. And, you know, at first they were, I didn't warn patients of this and they were freaked out and I was freaked out. But as I've done more and more of these, I kind of just give them the warning, listen, for a week, you may be miserable. Don't worry, you're gonna get back to baseline in a week or two. And then really from the third week on, you're gonna to start to see improvement. Uh, and that's really, for 99% of cases, this is literally what I find. My protocol, typically I have the NP or PA call two to three days after procedure. I'll see them back in clinic four to six weeks, and this is when their scores are really starting to go down. And then I'll try to get an MRI and a, a visit in six months um, post. Um, you know, a lot of these patients, again, are healthy. A lot of my patients are coming from hours away. And so oftentimes they'll say, why the hell do I need an MRI? I'm doing great. You, you've done fantastic. I will see you if I ever need you again, and, and so be it. You know, obviously, if we did things on clinical trial, it'd be helpful to have um, all those things. Um, okay, so you know, qu quickly, I'll go through uh, some of the FAQs that I had when I was starting off, and just give you kind of a, a quick guide to that. Um, what should I read when I when you start? Well, I think that it's um, sorry. I think it's really important to read a couple of things. I've actually put a few of the urology. Uh, citations into the PowerPoint itself, which I think is, is good to read. From our uh, literature, I think reading uh, Isaacson's paper in radiographics is really nice because it gives you a nice overview of the anatomy as well. And then uh, this sort of older paper from Carnival at least gives you an idea of how, how they did it. Uh, this is obviously a couple of years old now, but it, it just helps in giving some uh, guidelines from a technical standpoint. Um, this is my um, my protocol um, for our team here. And I think it's really helpful to have a protocol written out as you're starting to do this. So our all nurses and techs um, have this, and this is essentially what we go through. So the nurse navigator knows exactly what to do. Um, I usually have them hold finasteride and then I discontinue it post. I'll have them stay on Flomax and alpha blockers because I find that it's helpful, particularly for those patients who may go into retention. And then I'll usually DC that within their, at their six week visit if they're on it because they say, you know, I'm doing great. Do I really need to take this anymore? Um, Cipro is what I use for antibiotics. Uh, it can be PO or oral. It has the same bioavailability. I use a condom catheter, as I said, no Foley. Um, I give them the instructions on what I do. And then post-procedure, I'll put them on a few different medications. Cipro, obviously, for infection control. I'll put them on a medication for bladder spasm, as well as something for mild pain. And because I'm giving them ibuprofen, I'll give them some GI prophylaxis. Um, I've had two patients who required something a little bit stronger than ibuprofen. Both of them actually were physicians who came and um, uh, got the procedure done on them. Both of them, <laughs> funny story, both of them actually called me a couple of weeks after and said, you know, I'm, uh, I, I had some old Percocet, so I took it and I felt fine after that. And so those are the only two patients, that my two physicians that I've treated are the only two patients who needed things uh, stronger than ibuprofen. So we, we are weak, we are weak individuals. Um, 
What size do I treat? Anything above 40. 40 is typically my minimum, but I'll treat a 50 gland and I've had great results with people with 50 gram prostate. It's even 45 gram prostates. Now, there are situations where I'll say, you know what, your prostate's not that big. Um, is there something else going on here? And you know, if a prostate is small and they have LUTs, that may be a indication that, okay, I'm gonna get some urodynamic studies or uroflow studies at the very least to understand a little bit and make sure that their symptoms are really due to bladder outlet obstruction and not something else. And that takes me to, you know, do I get uroflow or urodynamic studies? And the answer is sometimes, you know, uroflow studies are on a, on a in non-invasive, right? You just pee into a cup. Urodynamic studies require a Foley catheter placement and pressure measurements and those kind of things. So I will find that a lot of patients will have come in with Euroflow studies because the virology office offers them, they'll often have it. And this is what you're looking for. A normal curve sort of goes up and comes down. This is measuring your, your urinary flow rate. An obstructed curve is flattened. Flatten the curve, baby. Um, that's, what's, that's what an obstructed curve looks like. And so I will order them sometimes if I am confused or if I find that there's some issues or that I'm not 100% sure that this person, uh, this person's issues are due to uh, bladder outlet obstruction. And then do I need to refer them to urologists? Well, no, you know, most of them actually have urologists, some of them won't. If they've never had a urologist and never had a workup for BPH, well, that's when I actually refer them to urologists and that's helped me build some relationships. Um, but I don't routinely refer them to urologists if they already have one. Um, but again, you know, I mean, it helps build relationships. Now I get some referrals from urology, not a lot, but I definitely get some um, from urology after this. Uh, I talked about the Foley. No, I don't think you need a Foley. I don't really find it helpful. It increases infection risk and patient discomfort. Uh, I'd be curious to think what others who've done cases out there think, but I really don't find it helpful at all, so I don't place a Foley. Um, should I do a cone beam up front? And, you know, I, again, I would talk about this a little bit. I do it for the first few cases to get comfortable, um, and then typically I wean myself off of the reliance on it, but definitely have it as a backup option always, uh, because I think it's, it's very helpful to have as a backup option. And then uh, admitting patients, nope, I, I don't admit my patients. I think it, it builds confidence. I've had no issues not admitting patients. Um, it builds confidence for them that it's an outpatient procedure and that they're going home the same day, which is what a lot of patients are looking for. And so I, I don't see any reason to admit, admit patients. I've never had any issues. Um, a question that I, I still have uh, in reality is how much embolic? Um, and I'm trying to look at our results and kind of put this together. But basically, I would say that the embolic kind of varies and it's not always based on gland size. Um, my general rule of thumb is I try to get four to 10 cc's of very dilute uh, 100 to 300 micron particles in there. And that's my general rule. Um, again, I'm, I'm actually curious on chat for some of the others um, who are who are looking uh, and what they're doing. But that's, that's my general rule um, that I try to get in there. So um, how to build a practice? Well, you know, market to patients. I, I really, um, this is how I did it. I marketed directly to patients. As soon as I did that, I started getting referrals. And then patients told their patients, and then patients told their patients, I'm sorry, patients told their friends. And then eventually some of the urologists got on board. Basically, it, it took a while, but it then opened up to a floodgate because the results were get, they were getting were, were fantastic. All of these men are in their 60s, 70s. They're mostly retired. They're playing golf uh, five days a week. They're going down to Florida you know, in the, in, the, in the winter, they tell their buddies, they have a bunch of buddies who talk about peeing all the time. As soon as they get through a round of golf without having to go pee, they ask their, their buddies, look at them and say, how the hell did you do that? And the guy says, I went to get a PAE with this guy and they fly up and they see. So like, that's, that's really how this practice has been built. And I really think that for us as IRs, we got to market directly to patients. Um, we can't rely on urology referrals. It's not going to come anytime soon. Um, but you can build relationships with urology, obviously, as, as you go. But I think it's very effective uh, procedure is really, I mean, again, I was skeptical at first when I started, but it's really, really been uh, phenomenal for all my patients. All right, so um, that's that. You know, obviously I tried to go through um, a whole lot there um, very quickly. Um, hopefully I provided some general overview and gave um, some insight into those of you guys who are getting started. Um, I'm open for any questions uh, that come up now and, and would love to sort of answer them uh, as best as I can. Uh, somebody uh, asked a question for, for patients who are um, 
fully dependent pre-op, how do you manage them um, post-op? So um, patients who are currently in urinary retention, I offer this to all the time. In fact, though I've probably done um, maybe 15 to 20 cases of patients who are in urinary retention. So they've had a catheter in um, and don't want to terp been able to get a catheter out in every one of them except for one. There was one patient we couldn't get the catheter out and he had to go to TERP. So it definitely has a very good efficacy. Um, basically the way I manage them is that I found that I leave it in for two weeks. Um, early on I was taking it out after a week and two of my patients came back and had to get it had to get recatheterized because they went into retention again. So I typically give them two weeks and then I'll do avoiding trial. Um, if they don't have a urologist, I'll do avoiding trial. I try not to do avoiding trial because we're just not well set up for avoiding trial in clinic, right? Um, but it is what it is. Um, the more you do, the better your sort of uh, ancillary staff may get at it. But in our case, we're just not very well set up. So I try to get them to go to the urologist for avoiding trial. And also, by the way, once they um, once they get the avoiding trial, they the urologist says, oh, you know, your catheter's out. What happened? I got a PAE. Okay, great. It worked. Um, so I, I try to send them back there. So I keep them. I give them two weeks, then I try to take the fully out the voiding trial. I'll keep them on Flomax uh, throughout the voiding trial and, and that often helps. Um, and so that's kind of how I manage those, those patients. Um, cool, so there's another question. Um, do you see a rebound in symptoms, prostate size from the results that were initially successful and, and what do you do as next step? So I have, I've been doing this for a year, right? Um, and so the only patient that has come back is that patient who I described in the talk, who I was only able to embolize one side on. And in six months, he came back and said, hey, I, um, I'm having symptoms again. And so in that patient, I actually went back and did the other side because I knew that, you know, um, I only had, I was only, I only did that one side the first time. So in that case, I actually did um, go back and embolize the other side and that's how i managed that patient uh on, on that time um the the rest of the patients i had nobody come back and and uh have size problems yet or have rebound symptoms yet i guess i would anticipate that patients will over the course of a couple of years i think the literature sort of suggests that a small percentage of patients maybe five to ten percent will need re-embolization on the on, the, on another in another uh setting and so i typically tell my patients at, at pre-op that, listen, you may need a tune-up at some point. We may need to go back and, and do something um, to tune you up to make sure that you, um, if a artery recanalizes, if a new artery grows, et cetera, et cetera. And, and basically, I give them that warning up front that, if, that a small percentage of patients may need that. Um, cool. Any uh, other questions that I can answer? You can try to answer best I can. Uh, okay, there's a question out there that says, um, you know, would I recommend initiating PAE in a lab uh, not equipped with cone beam? Um, you know, as I said, I use cone beam in, in probably 30% of cases at this point as a bailout. Um, I have to say that it's probably helpful to have up front, but is it 100% necessary? No. Um, you know, in, in lots of cases, I don't do any cone beam, but I, you know, I think if you have no option for it, then you really have to, um, then you really have to be confident and, or uh, I would almost say, you know, be, be willing to say, you know what, I couldn't find the origin or, you know what, I, I just wasn't sure what that was. And so I didn't want to embolize. So I guess, yes, um, you can certainly start in a place that doesn't have cone beam, um, but I think it is helpful to have as, as with anything else. Um, Average procedure time, uh, Kavi's asking. So this is definitely, this is actually something that uh, I wanna look at from our data, which is that early on, I was slotting these for three hours and it was taking, it was taking time. Um, once I learned sort of um, getting, getting more efficient in it, uh, now is typically an hour and a half procedure time or so. And, and the big thing for me that saved a whole lot of effort, number one, uh, was not doing cone beams up front and everybody because the cone beams were definitely taking some time to set up and arms overhead. And sometimes if I was doing radial and the room was flipped, that was being an issue with the cone beam and just positioning the patient. So that was sort of a technical staff um, uh, learning curve that we got over. 
Now we do them much faster from a, from a radial approach, even though the patient's flipped. But the other thing that really, really helped me was actually when I didn't plan out all the angles up front and didn't try to get a perfect angle in uh, from my 3D reconstructions, et cetera, I often found it very helpful to just go in and say, okay, 35 to 55 ipsilateral, 10 cranial, this is what I'm gonna do, let me find the origin. Um, the last thing that I found to really, really increase my, uh, improve my efficiency in this and to get my cases down to about an hour were, um, was the, basically the, on, at least from, uh, from our GE machine, it's called the blended mask, which is you could take a DSA, uh, store that DSA and use it as your blended mask and use it as a roadmap. That was really, really, really spectacular for me because I got these beautiful DSA images. I was able to uh, select it and hold exactly the image I wanted with maximum pacification. Once I did that, I knew exactly where I was aiming for, and I didn't have to do a single injection, didn't have to move the table, didn't have to do anything post that. I uh, was basically just able to get a wire in there and, and be done with it. So those are the things that I found um, really improved efficiency. And then I think just getting better at, the, at it as anything else. Um, you know, basically the, the better, as we all get better at anything, we're just going to get faster. So early on, it was taking me uh, two and a half to three hours per case. And now it's down to about an hour, hour and a half uh, per case. And that's, that's with fellow, um, our fellows have gotten very proficient in it as well. Um, do I have cutoffs in terms of prostate size, too small, too big? So um, most of the literature out there is about glands, 40 grams and over. And so that is my cutoff. So if somebody has a 30 gram prostate, I, I don't really offer it to them. And there have been cases I've seen in clinic of patients who we do the MR and their prostate's just tiny. And I say, listen, you know, I don't really feel like this is going to help you. Am I 100% sure it's not going to help them? No. But I say that, you know, there might be other options for you or you may want to see urologists just to... Um, and talk about some of the other options. Um, Eurolift, by the way, is a procedure that's done in the office that's done for um, prostates that are under 60 grams and don't have median lobe hypertrophy. And that's often a very helpful uh, procedure for patients and is, is one of the uh, procedures which I'll talk to my patients about and say, listen, like that's an option for you. And it's very minimally invasive. It's very easy to do. There's no cutting. Maybe you should see a um, practitioner who offers that. Not all urologists offer it, but I have seen it be helpful in patients. But basically 40 grams is my cutoff. Uh, nothing too big. Uh, we've done a 300 gram prostate, nothing too big. You know, um, basically it, the, the initial procedure was really developed uh, in patients whose prostates were so big that they Terp wasn't going to help them. And so um, really the bigger, I have no upward cutoff of how big uh, that I'll try it on. Twitter, that's my email. Feel free to, feel free to hit me up anytime. Uh, happy to talk um, in more detail, particularly for those who are getting started. Hopefully that was helpful guys. Uh, appreciate your time this morning.